Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Thung Earthlets, welcome to another episode of the 2080 Thrillcast. I am your host, Molchar, and uh, we've got three lovely, lovely special guests this week for you. We have Mark Simpson, otherwise known as the artist Jock, who uh, will be chatting to us uh, about his time at 2080 to coincide with the release of uh, a book all uh, featuring all of his art. Also, if you've ever wondered what goes into making a cover for 2000 AD, we have Pete Wells, the creator of the 2000 AD Covers Uncovered blog, which is now an official part of 2000adonline.com. Uh, if you go to our website and click on the news tab, you will see uh, alongside uh, links to the podcast and our ABC videos and all the latest news. You'll see links to uh, uh, to Pete's blog posts where uh, artists share with him uh, the uh, the process behind some of the amazing covers that you see on the front of the Galaxy's Greatest Comic from uh, the ideas, from the discussions that they have with uh, uh, Matt Smith, our, our main editorial droid, uh, all the way through to the finished product. Also, some blistering puns to enjoy. That's on the blog every week, and it's uh, absolutely fascinating to go behind the scenes on uh, some of our covers. So we're going to be talking to Pete about uh, why he does that every week and uh, talk about some of his favourite covers as well. Uh, so on this episode, we have uh, not one, not two, but three special guests. Um, uh, it's a delight to welcome back Steve McManus, the former editor of 2080 from the 1980s, uh, to the Thrillcast, we're going to be talking to him um, about uh, The Mighty One, which is the memoir that he's written about his time uh, at uh, The Galaxy's Greatest, uh, which is being published this week. Uh, it was uh, a delight to welcome him into the office uh, because uh, he was here to sign the copies, which uh, are now sold out from, uh, from our web shop. But uh, yeah, it'd be great to talk to Steve later. Now, just recently, you will have heard two fairly big pieces of news, I'm sure. But for those of you who are playing catch up, the first off is that on the 1st of October, we're going to be staging uh, an international signing event uh, to celebrate the publication of our 2000th issue. The Prog 2000 signing day is taking place in London, Eastbourne, uh, Cardiff, Shrewsbury, Manchester, uh, Edinburgh, uh, and also LA and Sydney. Um, we're going to have uh, creators signing copies of the uh, of the landmark issue. Just some of the creators uh, that are going to be participating uh, are John Wagner, uh, Mick McMahon, Conor McNeil, Boo Cook, Steve Yao, Liam Moore, John Repian, Lee Gallagher, Tom Foster. Um, so make sure you go along to 2080online.com to the news section to uh, see all the latest news about the signings that we are setting up. It's going to be an absolutely awesome day. Um, and uh, yeah, make sure you get a signed copy of Prog 2000. The other big news which uh, popped up on the BBC was that uh, 2000 AD uh, um, Rebellion Publishing have purchased uh, some of the biggest classic comics of the 1970s and 80s, uh, including uh, comics like Roy the Rovers, um, girls comics like Misty and Tammy, uh, Action, Battle, and humour titles such as uh, Whoopi and Wizard and Chips. Um, this is all part of a, a huge deal that we'll see uh, 2000 AD, reprinting um, some of these classic stories uh, from comics that have languished in the archives for many years. Uh, so this is a major, major piece of news for us. It's going to be very busy over the next few years. Um, reaction has been absolutely fantastic. So thank you to everyone who has uh, shared the news uh, with their friends. Uh, we're very much looking forward to diving into this archive and uh, seeing what's what. But again, go on to uh, 2080online.com forward slash news to see all the latest news from the galaxy's greatest comic. Now, as I said, every week on the 2080 website, you will be able to see uh, a post detailing the process behind that week's 
cover on 2000 AD and it's absolutely fascinating to see how our Zajaz artists bring to life some of our greatest characters all the way from the original ideas that they discuss with editorial all the way through to the finished product. The man who brings you these weekly updates is Mr Pete Wells who uh, is the brains behind the 2000 AD covers uncovered blog which has now been absorbed by 2000adonline.com and uh, it was great to chat to Pete uh, about why he started the blog and uh, what he enjoys about peeking behind the scenes. And it's fantastic to, to welcome me old mate Pete Wells to the 2000AD Thrillercast. How are you doing, Pete? Hello! I'm doing great. <laughs> Thank you for beaming us in. It was nice of you to tidy up. <laughs> Not at all, not at all. Um, I so, Lord yours needs to have a look at that side at all. <laughs> Um, so we're uh, we're getting you on because uh, your blog, um, 2080 Covers Uncovered, uh, which has been going for how many years? Um, seven, I think. Seven years. Um, that me. that is now uh, officially part of the 2080 blog on 2080online.com. You fools! <laughs> <laughs> I've only had to censor you a couple of times. Let's face it. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about it. So why, why, why did you, why did you decide to start a blog about, um, going kind of behind the scenes on, on 2080s covers? There are uh, various reasons, all as important as each other, I think. Um, <laughs> when I was a child, I have fond memories of Christmas Day with, with me, 2000 AD and me Judge Dread annuals. Mm. And, and one of the first things I used to turn to was always the um, when the artists used to talk about what their covers of the year were. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And why? Um, and that that side of things always really fascinated us. Um, but similarly, I'm a big collector of, of artwork myself, mm. um, and I get to see the work that goes into a piece that perhaps your casual reader. Um, might not get to see, and I wanted it to explore that and kind of have have a record of it. Mm. Um, the the cover that that really made us start it was good old Henry Flint, mm. thirty year of dread cover yeah. for Prog fifteen thirty six, and he'd done a, a beautiful image of dread, which lots of people will recognise. And in the background, he'd had a menagerie of all of dreads greatest villains um but when he colored it he kind of put a pink digital wash over the top and i, I was lucky enough to buy that piece from him mm. and when i got it um the, the details and things that had been lost uh, we've, we've discussed this i'm sure he won't mind us <laughs> talking about it um it just kind of it blew us away and i thought i need to share this i need to share this aversion with everyone um <laughs> So it was that particular cover that, that kick-started it. Um, and then the, the amazing thing, the thing that always blows my mind, is that many of our covers are absolute masterpieces. Mm. Um, and although we do get to see them time and time again, seeing graphic novels and things like that, um, realistically, the shelf life's a week. Yeah. And that's a, that's a crime. <laughs> um, so I wanted a sort of permanent record, a testament to, to those covers and the, the work that goes into them. You uh, do this every week. Um, is, is, it, is it hard work kind of keeping up? Because I, 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 know, I know from my own experience with, with, with 2000 AD that, that, you know, no sooner have I publicised one prog than another one's coming along. So sort of gathering all this information together every week, um, is, is it a bit of a... Bit of a grind sometimes. <laughs> um, yes and no. Um, I'm very, very lucky that the artists are so generous and kind and, and often um, they'll send me things quite a while in advance yeah. and I get, get an awful lot of help from you guys if I need it, which I would like to publicly thank you for. <laughs> um, plus there's a lot of um, 2000 AD knowledge trapped in my head that, that's desperate to come out. <laughs> um but it can be, uh, it can also be a bind sometimes, tracking down artists and um, sometimes giving them a polite little nudge and saying, hiya, um, <laughs> can I just remind you um, to send that cover? But it, it's it's all absolutely worth it because sad though it may sound, 
it's the highlight of my week, you know. Mm. <laughs> I really enjoy writing it. <laughs> um, and for me, um, these many of these artists are my sort of John Lennon or Paul McCartney are the heroes of mine. So it's, it's a pleasure to, to write to them and interact with them. And so while it can be time consuming, and I do have quite a sort of stressful and, and time consuming job. Mm. Um, in my life, <laughs> um, it's it's worth every every minute that I spend on it. I really, really do enjoy mm. this it, part of my week. Has it changed the way that you think about covers on 2000 AD? Has, has it developed your, your your appreciation of the work that goes into them? Almost definitely, yeah. Um, I think sort of looking at the spread of covers over the years, I think we've had like various epochs of cover, haven't we? That's not too pretentious. <laughs> so in the early days, mostly drawn with a brush, lots of cut and piece and things like that. Um, but the work that, that went into them was just amazing. And when I've been looking today, there are artists such as Carlos and, and Mick McMahon who – like there, there are periods where they did five out of the ten covers and did a strip on top. Mm. It's just sort of phenomenal. But then from there we went to kind of the painted stuff. And that's mind-boggling, isn't it? Because as I said earlier, we have some absolute masterpieces that could be hanging in galleries <laughs> um, that just blow me mind. And now we're in the digital age. Mm. Um, again, the skill and the ingenuity on show is phenomenal. And, and as we've seen from the blog, many of the artists have done a mixture of all three. So they might have done the inks traditionally, um, coloured it on the computer or coloured aspects of it. And it's used photo reference. It's just, it's just amazing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So yes, but uh, but as I said previously as well, that was why I wanted to start it, to to show everybody else just how much goes into a a cover, the blood, sweat, and tears <laughs> and oil that goes into it. And uh, is there a? Uh, I mean, I've all, you've done it for seven years, so that is hundreds of covers. Are there particular ones that stand out to you as as, as being your favourites? Oh, um, absolutely, thousands of them. You know, um, <laughs> because over the last seven years, I haven't just covered seven years of covers. I've, I've kind of tried to do a, the breadth of, of covers, so there were uh, thousands that really stand out. Um, there are particular um, contributors that that stand out, so. If I'm getting a, a Disraeli cover, I always know that I'm going to get lots and lots of um, excellent stuff to be able to, to put into the blog. Mm. Um, but I know if I'm getting a, I don't know, a jock cover, it's going to blow me, me head off when I get it. <laughs> um, there were a couple of, yeah, um, a one that I really liked was a Detonator X cover by Carl Richardson. Mm. So this was, um, I have the prog number written here, which I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. <laughs> um, but it was essentially a massive Tyrannosaurus Rex Godzilla type of monster mm. fighting a giant robot, which <laughs> you can't go wrong with. And what I really liked about this this cover was it was very much in the form of a B movie poster. Mm. So the designer had put massive sort of type face all over it, like it came from Mars or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and it, that was completely over um, a scene of the Houses of Parliament being sort of smashed to smithereens. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> When I was when I put a clean version of that cover up on the blog, um, Carl sort of sent us an email and thanked us so much because he'd said that Houses of Parliament bit it took him two days or something to render, yeah. <laughs> and then was wiped out by 
<laughs> you know, highly appropriate and it's an art in itself, but a massive bit of sort of typeface right across the top of it. <laughs> um, so that was a nice one to be able to show in its entirety, you know. Um, so that that's a nice memory, but there are, there are so many. Um, there, there are times when I'll open the email and I'll gasp. Mm. Like that's always lovely. Um, so some of Greg Staples' covers, for example, uh, it'll ping on me email and it's, it's like I hold me breath before <laughs> before I open it up. Or things like um, if Carlos Esquera sends us something who's like sort of uh, absolute hero of mine, that, that just blows me away. Um, I understand that you're talking to Jock at some point um, and my very favourite cover, or one of my very favourites, um, was his wraparound cover of Prog 1450, mm. which is Dread sitting on the uh, the 2000 day logo with Mega City 1 in the back, and I'm very lucky en- enough to own the original artwork for that now. Oh, wow. But that's, yeah, <laughs> it, uh, it took a few trades, but I got there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, there are many. I mean, it's, it's very difficult, isn't it? The, the joy of the, the cover is that it's so subjective. Mm. So my favourite could be your least favourite, you know, and I think we see each year on the um, message board we vote for our favourites and the spread are quite, uh, quite staggering sometimes and speaks of volumes for sort of the joy of a cover and, and how people's uh, tastes are so different, I suppose. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so... I don't know, and it would be crass, I think, for us to to name particular <laughs> ones. I think, but certainly, I love uh, I love any any cover that I'm going to get from Diz. Really, I get excited about because I know that he's going to sometimes sends videos to go with that. <laughs> um, Mark Harrison always. Um, I always learn something from him. He puts so much into his work, so many references, and and he'll often send Photoshop brushes and things like that. Mm. Um, just uh, everybody's amazing. Um, one of the, the fun things I've enjoyed about the, the 2018 Covers Uncovered experience um, <laughs> is I have a kind of unofficial battle with Varg. I don't think he knows this. Um, <laughs> but I like to try and outpun him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a joy. So if I see a, a, a prog cover... Um, the tagline is always kind of one of the first things I look at to yeah. see if I can outdo them. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we're about 50-50 at the moment. Right, okay. okay. <laughs> and of course now you, you, you're you part of the official 2000 AD blog and uh, the updates uh, uh, go go up on there. Um, what, when What's it like to, to actually have that kind of seal of approval? <laughs> it's uh, it's honestly it's a dream come true. Um, I've been a lifelong 2000 AD fan of from five years old. Mm. Um, so, um, as I said, many of the artists and the writers are my sort of heroes. Mm. Um, so it's phenomenal to to interact with those. But then, yeah, to be accepted as part of the the gang is very very exciting <laughs> for me. Um, I'm a wheaton, my armour plating to become a droid at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, it really is a big thrill. And I've put a, a lot of work in, into the blog, totally willingly, because as I said, it is something I absolutely love doing. Mm. Um, so it, it's really gratifying to, to feel recognised for that. Brilliant, brilliant. And with, uh, I mean, the comics are um, one of those mediums where the, 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 the cover is such a vital part of the book because it's the thing that attracts people. You know, it, it's 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 got to relate. Like most book covers, but but I don't know. There's something about comics covers that uh, have, there's the <laughs> opportunity to to do so much more than just relate what is inside. Um, do you do you think that uh, that 2080 covers in particular provide something special? Because you you look at the ones that you know beyond the the, the the time that you've been doing the blog, you know, some of those images like Dread sat on the uh, uh, the kind of crumbling remains of, yes. uh, of, of uh, crime. Getting uh, piles. Uh, yeah. 
um, and uh, you know, so so many of these huge iconic covers, they 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 are iconic in of themselves. You know, beyond what is actually in inside the comic itself. Itself. Yeah, that is the joy, isn't it? Mm. Um, the, the cover's like your shop window, isn't it? Mm. Um, and sometimes it relates to the story, and sometimes it's just a cool, iconic image, and and both have equal merit, don't they? Mm. Um, as, I, as I said before, the sheer number of iconic covers that we got from some key um, creators back in the day is just phenomenal because mm. those images we've seen time and time and time again. And and as I said, the, <laughs> the, there are times when Carlos or Mick were pro- would, would producing the cover every other week and would probably have a strip within the comic. And you just think, how on earth <laughs> like, did these people operate? Yeah. It's incredible. But, yeah, I definitely think that the 2000 AD leads the way in, in covers. And, and it's amazing because there are some some absolute favourites, some like Kev O'Neill things have I operated on my brain. <laughs> oh, yes, Metal um, Zoic, yeah. Yeah, Metal Zoic, big robotic gorilla. Um, like that sort of jumps out at you and sort of smacks you around the face, doesn't it, and says, mm. buy me. <laughs> but then at the same time, uh, a quieter cover such as sort of Greg Staples' dread headshot mm. um, has the same impact it, it's just amazing it'll be brilliant if we could distill what it is and <laughs> <laughs> um but oh, it's just fab isn't it yeah no, no absolutely absolutely and um beyond the ones that you've done on your blog what's your favorite classic cover oh <laughs> yeah. That's like asking us to name me favourite child and favourite pasty. <laughs> um, it's impossible. There, there are so many. There are so many um, bollant covers that you could just marry. Um, <laughs> there are so many Cliff Robinson sort of inventive covers that, that you could love. I love. Um, I'm just going to pluck a one from the air. Uh-huh. Um, I'm going to see. Maybe it's Cliff Robinson's Give Me Your Perps, Your Muties. Yes. Your yeah, yeah. Cycles with the, the Statue of Liberty because that was just something that, that resonated with me as a child and I still see it now and and it's probably more relevant to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, are, there are so many. Um, I have to say that the Art of Dread book that, that you brought out a, a couple of years ago hmm. Um that's so well thumbed because I just constantly look through that and and on a different day that covers me favourite on, on another day another covers me favourite um, just thinking about it um, the cover of um, the Judge Dread Annual 1988 it's a cover by John Higgins yeah um, where it's just Mega City One and then a beautifully painted dread head. I'm going to say that. Right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but tomorrow it will be something completely different. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, Pete, uh, thank you so much for being a part of uh, the 2080 blog and uh, it's uh, an and honour bringing. It's an uh, honor. Bringing uh, the covers to uh, to life with the behind the scenes stuff and and long may it continue. It will. (laughs) (laughs) Whether we like it or not. (laughs) (laughs) Now, for those of you who are long-term 2000 AD fans, uh, or indeed comics fans in general, shouldn't need any introduction for my next guest, who is uh, one of the biggest names to ever come out of the pages of 2000 AD. Mark Simpson, otherwise known as Jock, uh, started off drawing uh, Lenny Zero, Judge Dredd uh, for uh, for 2000 AD, as well as uh, strips like Tales of Tel Goose um, and uh, some absolutely iconic images of Judge Dredd. He went on to draw the uh, the Losers for Vertigo and also Batman for DC and uh, as I said is one of the biggest names in comics. Coming out soon is uh, The Art of Jock which is a book that takes a retrospective of his entire career 
uh, and looks at uh, the various stages of his work and has some uh, pretty interesting uh, interviews with him and the people that he's worked with. Um, I talked to Jock about his uh, his career, specifically um, his time on 2000 AD and uh, what it's been like to revisit uh, his work for the galaxy's greatest comic. And it's fantastic to welcome for the first time onto the 2080 Thrillcast, Jock. Hey, Mike. <laughs> How's it going? I'm very good, thanks. How good, are you doing? Good, good. I'm well, thank you. So we, we, we're here to talk about your work on 2000 AD um, yep. because uh, you have a, a book out which uh, uh, details uh, your your whole career, but obviously um, there's one bit of your career that we want to focus on, which is uh, your work for the galaxy's greatest. Um, I mean, I'm, I've heard it multiple times before, but, but tell us the story again of, of, of how you came to be working at 2000 AD. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I was uh, I was living in Totnes in Devon um, with my good friend uh, Dom Reardon, and we were we were trying to 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 work in comics. Basically, you know, we were getting together and drawing and painting and making pages, and um, we uh, we decided to take our work to a comic convention, which was actually up in Glasgow, um, and we thought, being being young and skint, that it would be a good <laughs> idea to try and hitchhike up to glasgow in one day um which which uh, was maybe uh, optimistic but it mm. totally worked we, we got there at like 11 30 at night um so we managed to do it in one day and yeah and we, we went to a, to a glasgow comic con and um we showed our work to glenn fabry mm. who uh, very politely told us to f off and make some money um <laughs> and uh, steve mcmanus uh, heard about this who, mm. who, who was at the convention and actually came looking for me and dom and uh um and that led to our first work in in the comic so it was it was, it was quite a you know a fortuitous and kind of lucky time because we were really going up there you know blind and naive and, and luckily we met steve who, who was uh who was fantastic because mm. you were a very different artist back then because uh you know certainly some of the the, the first stuff that you did for 2000 ad was was uh painted pinups yeah yeah um because you you wanted to be a painter didn't you yeah, I did. Yeah, it was um, at the time. It was uh, guys like Kent Williams and John J. Muth and Bill Sienkiewicz and Dave McKean that, that I really liked, um, and uh, I, I liked the way that they were amazing painters, but they were also working in comics, and 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 and, and both me, myself, and Don were, were were wanting to do that basically. So, and, and but even in two thousand and eight, you know, there was a brilliant painters. Well, obviously, Bisley was was one, um, mm. and uh, although that spawned a a period that I'm not so keen on, you know, with the, the kind of copycat painters that maybe weren't quite as talented as Simon was. Um, mm. You know, there were some amazing painters, Dermot Power, you know, for example, I think yeah. he, was, he was great. So, so it seemed natural to, to, to paint my work at the time, but actually um, my first strip was, was a dread strip and it was actually Andy Diggle that, that phoned me up and said, can you do, 12 pages of dread in a month and i sort of lied and said yes <laughs> even though I, even though i hadn't drawn any black and white pages you know for 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 a long time and mm. um uh, but but uh you know we went for it and i did it and you know the rest is history as they say yeah i mean th th that first sort of black and white style that you had on on dread was yeah uh it, it stood out for lots of reasons but one of those was was that um it it had a real sense of movement the, uh -huh. that uh the the way that you were um balancing your lights and your, your darks and and uh, the way that you were structuring the page everything seemed to be almost kind of vibrating with 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 movement i mean was was this a style that that you kind of um in in the panic of the moment you kind of went i'll draw it like this no no i mean that's nice to hear actually because mm. uh, uh, you know to me comics should should feel a little bit alive you know mm. they should they should there should be movement in, especially in an action comic like 2018 <laughs> um you know i know I, I remember uh, quite early on going to the 2018 offices and 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 andy diggle had uh, had uh, just uh, got delivery of some of henry flint's artwork on nemesis which was probably around mm. around year 2000 
and he sort of opened the drawer and showed me some of Hen- Henry's um, original pages. And he sort of looked at me and he sort of held his hands over the artwork and he said, you can feel it, can't you? And I was like, what? He goes, the thrill power, you can feel it, can't you? <laughs> and, and, I was, and like it sounds silly, but like the art was so so energetic and alive that it was like, yeah, there, there is a tangible thing about drawing comics where, where you can give a page, you know, some energy and some movement and some mm. life. And, you know, no, it, you know, it, it, it wasn't a sort of... Um, such a conscious decision for me as much as that I felt like that's the kind of, you know, images that, that, that I wanted to draw, you know? So, um, so, uh, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it was, it, it's, 2000 has always had the history of, 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 you know, mind blowing artwork and, and, uh, you know, it just seemed natural to try and give, give, uh, the page, you know, movement and, mm. and excitement, you know? I mean, you, you weren't with us for for very long um, before sure. you went off to do the losers with Andy at, uh, at at Vertigo. But in that space of time, you seem to be part of uh, a, a gang of artists who all relatively started around about the same time. So there was yourself, there was Dom, um, yep. there was Fraser Irving, Fraser, um, yeah. you know Henry, Henry Flint as well. I mean, he, you know, he, he he'd been working for us for for a little while on Rogue Trooper, but he really kind of changed um, the way that he did things. Yeah, he yeah he he kind of blo- uh, to me that that nemesis story he so suddenly blossomed mm. into just like a whole nother level and, and uh, yeah and that, that was around the time that I started working. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did, did you did you have a a sense at the time of being like these young Turks who were coming in and, <laughs> and, and, and all have very different styles as well. Um, I mean, not really. I mean, me and Fraser used, used to spend a lot of time to get together because we did literally sort of start at the same time and we were, you know, we were, we were, um, we we're both lucky to, to then have constant work and, and, and be courted by the American publishers and do some of that stuff as well. So, um, um, that, I mean, to be honest, you know, I, I think when you're, when you're younger like that, you, I was, I was just kind of hungry to be doing it. I wasn't really thinking about, um, about what my position was. I was just trying to make the most of the position that I had, if mm. that makes sense, you know, and just, just try and do something, uh, something exciting i mean and it was the same when we went to dc to do the losers as well you know it was mine and andy's first monthly comic but um we were both just really hungry we were both really keen to to make it work because you know it, it could have been our, our only job for all we knew you know we, mm. we, we could have got we could have got it wrong it could have gone badly and then that would have been that but uh but again luckily you know it sort of it it, it went the other way um but uh i mean looking back on it now i mean i still feel like a newcomer really but i'm clearly not i've been i've, I've been doing it uh 15 years now so mm. that there's nothing new about that anymore but um so it's you know so i, I guess i guess i can see that at the time that, 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 that there was maybe a few of us that were kind of you know bringing you know like a new wave of, of creators coming in as 2000 years had over over the years and it feels amazing that maybe we were we were one of those you know mm. i mean in that short space of time you you did some pretty iconic images of dread um yeah which which are so popular that let's face it i i reuse them on a regular basis for, <laughs> for marketing stuff just because it's so recognizable as, as as your style uh, who were you drawing on for your interpretation of dread well, i mean the truth is uh, you know dread was my favorite comic character and in lots mm. of ways he still is my favorite comic character mm. so uh, there, there was there wasn't i mean you know there's 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 you know i could i could name check you know when i was younger the bollands and, and then a little bit later on mike mcmahon and steve dillon and ron smith and all the people that made dread what he is mm. but um and you know obviously they kind of influenced elements but actually being first and foremost a fan i just drew what what i you know, like an uh, amalgam of, of what of what he sort of meant to me, I guess. I mean, mm. that sounds a little, a little bit, you know, I don't want to sound pretentious, but that, but that, but that's kind of true. That that is what you do. You know, you just draw on all, on all your influences and 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 cook it up and and see what comes out. And and I, I, I try not to think about it too much either. I just try and draw, you know, what I would like to see. So, um, you know, I I, uh, I was kind of surprised when people because people seemed to really respond to my dread, which was a really nice thing. Um, being again being a dread fan, mm. I was that, that was really I uh, felt very lucky. But um. But maybe that does just come from from being being a being a fan of the character, and yeah, I've been lucky since then to to work on characters that 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 um, that I'm a fan of first, and and I'm, uh, more often than not, it's that it's always those characters that that you're going to draw better, that you have some kind of you know kind of a 
um, feeling for. You know, that when I've worked on other characters that, that I've not that I've not read a whole lot of, you know, it just doesn't it does doesn't go so well, Mike. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's like the, 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 it's kind of missing that 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 ingredient. And mm. Dread was, you know, he yeah, I, you know, I, I think if anything about my stuff did work, it was just that that I really love the character and I was unable to bring that to it. Mm. What what was the process that you went through at 2000 AD? What what did you learn coming out of that? Um, uh, well, uh, to hit a deadline. <laughs> Very <laughs> important. I, uh, I can remember uh, uh, my second story was for David Bishop in, in the weekly. And um, I think he gave me two weeks per episode. And it mm. was like six page episodes. So it's only three pages a week. But but trust me, when you're starting out, that's that's... Yeah, that's that's tough. You know, it's mm. it's um, uh, to have that kind of regular output and for it all to be of a certain quality. You know, it's it's a very steep learning curve. And I can remember, you know, sort of. I think it was about part four. I have a five part story, and I had five of the pages done, and the deadline was the next day. And I took five pages to the post office, and um, but I hadn't finished the sixth one. But I put five in a parcel and sent it off on the on the last post from from the post office but then ran home finished the panel on page six and then separately packaged that up <laughs> and then and, and drove it up to exeter so that i kept so i could catch the eight thirty post from exeter to london so wow. they would both arrive on time and of course in, probably they they would, would have received the artwork and put it aside for a day before before getting it scanned and and you know but but at the same time it was kind of like just just having that kind of uh you know, just learning that kind of uh, responsibility was 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 a huge part of working for 2080. You know, mm. because it's 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 relentless. You know, it's a weekly comic. You know, I think what's the phrase? You know, it just eats pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, and it taught me to to deal with that. You know. Well, one thing that that, that has really come out when we've talked before uh, about your work is is your your strong sense of design and the way that you incorporate that into your artwork. So um, it it always seems to um, keep your art fresh and you know interesting is it's almost as if it's comic book art that isn't comic book art it kind of appeals to to an audience outside of that um how much of that is is uh from reading something like 2000 ad or uh, and how much of it is uh, external influence things that you've absorbed along the way yeah i, I mean i think when i by the time I, I, I got published, there was an element of external influences that I was interested in, you know, bringing design ideas from other things mm. rather than rather than comics into my comic work to do to try, like you say, to try and make it appeal to not just comic readers. But um, but actually, I feel like 2008, you know, from from seeing it when I was young, the the kind of I was talking to someone about this the other day. It's like the, the sort of the stories and the artwork was so sort of unique and and you know kind of I, I mean I was going to say personal that's maybe not quite the right word because there was you know science fiction stories but there was something about <laughs> the way the, the way they, they were you know the, the way that they were presented that were that felt very personal you know very, you could you could you could you could see like the you know the vo- you could the, the voice of the artists and the writers in in the stories you know and 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 um you know, I, I found that massively inspiring. You know, the, 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 you know, some of the American comics maybe feel a little bit more diluted, a little bit more like a kind of, you know, like a kind of um, uh, what's the word? Like, you know, like a sort of you know factory output of kind of fairly generic looking kind of things. And, mm. and two thousand two thousand eighty was the opposite. It was just massively sort of you know you turn the page and see kevin o'neill and then on another page there'd be Mick mcmahon doing his scratchy slain and then there'd be dave gibbons doing beautiful rogue trooper and it was just you know you know maybe personal is the right word actually if it felt like it felt like the voices were really strong and then and, and i found that really really inspiring and, and, and i guess that kind of informed the way that i approached it later on you, you talk about it it, it 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 being personal that there's a, a you felt a real connection to 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 what you were reading um yeah was there uh was there anything that um that you wish you'd worked on you know given time um if if you if you'd stayed with 2000 AD a, a, a bit longer was was there a character or a series that you would have really liked to get your teeth into 
Um, well, there's two really. One is that um, me and Andy had another Lenny Zero story all mm. planned, and I'd actually done character designs and five or six pages of layouts, which was called Zero Seven, that eventually saw print. Ben Wilshire drew it, actually, yes. um, you yeah. know, whenever it was two or three years ago. I would have loved to have done that because. Um, uh, you know, Lenny Zero was was our first creation. You know, so so uh, it kind of feels special, and, and and I would have loved to have to have drawn a bit more of that. But actually, um, I would have liked to have just done more Dread stories, to be honest. Mm. Um, uh, even though you know I've gone on to to work on Dread, you know, in in other ways, and that's really satisfying. There's the the the, 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 the my time in 2008 was so early on in my career that I, that I would have liked to have uh, drawn some more story pages of Dread. Mm. Really, yeah. Well, well, let's 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 talk about the other way that you got to work on Dread, which was uh, as uh, as the storyboarder uh, and designer on the, on the Dread movie. Um, sure, yeah. You you you. Uh, it, it's kind of funny the way you came to work in that, didn't you? Because you, you, you did some <laughs> you did some designs for fun that then ended up on the desk of Alex Garland. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I had just finished um, six weeks of uh, concert work on um, an adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune that, that never saw the light of day. That was going to be directed by Peter Berg, who I'd mm. got to know. Uh, he was going to be doing the Losers movie originally. Um, uh, so, and we stayed in touch and, uh, and I heard he was working on June and he said, do you want to do some concept work? And it was the first concept stuff that I'd done. Um, but I really enjoyed it because of it actually that, you know, doing the painted concept stuff is more akin to, to my painted work that I started out doing before, mm. before the black and white comics. So um, I, I actually really enjoyed doing that. And, and then, it was literally the end of uh, working on Dune when the new story that the new Dread movie was sort of greenlit, as it were, uh, came out. And it was literally on the Friday, and, and I did three images o- over the weekend just for my own amusement. And I put one of them online. And, and this was this was back in the day when uh, you used to have like an online directory of images, you know, that you just, you could store your images online. Mm. And, 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 and if so, each image had a web address. So if you put in like, you know, www.whatever slash just dread one, if you, if you change that one to two manually, you might find a, another image. And, and I, I put one of them online, a website found all three images by, I can only guess by changing the, 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 the host address mm. uh, sorry this is a bit boring isn't it but, the, but this is <laughs> this is this, this is what happened and but anyway but the, but all, all three images ended up on on io9.com as official uh concept art from from the movie and obviously i was kind of horrified mm. um i emailed jason at rebellion straight away to say listen this isn't this isn't me and and you know I'll, I'll try and take them down but of course by that point it was too late but the good thing was was that all all they were they were reported against uh, 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 sorry they were reported across all the film websites all mm. the ain't it called news slash film they all reported on it and more importantly they all wanted a really good dread movie and they saw the 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 concept art as a as a sign of it looking good which was which was a nice thing uh cut to getting an email from one of the producers saying uh can you call us please and i was like oh no this is this is going to be bad <laughs> because obviously that's just a really bad situation you know mm. some someone online claiming to have done work on the film that you're working on here that is not okay yeah. but uh the, but the, but no the flip side was that they actually really liked the images and didn't want to come up to london for a meeting to talk about working on the film and and that's that's what happened so you know i think i said it's elsewhere it's you know definitely believe in making your own luck but that but that was the most you know direct you know um uh the most sort of specific time that i really made my own luck and and you know carried on working with alex garland on his next two films and uh you know yeah i felt, you know, I felt very lucky very lucky so uh, on 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 the on the dread movie, I mean, we 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 brought out the the lovely um, uh, art of dread book uh, yes. that, that had all uh, all of your concept work in there and 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 the storyboards and the the, the script and everything. Um, that storyboard you 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 put that together in in, in a real rush, didn't you? Because it, it was it was quite a tight deadline. Yeah. That, so so in that first meeting, what they actually wanted uh, was a was a, a comic of of, of the script, a hundred page mm. comic. Um, and uh and i said well when when do you want this knowing that a hundred page comic you know could actually take anything from three months to 
to a year really and 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 they said uh you know, eight weeks and uh, i said okay <laughs> that's 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 uh that you know that's going to be tough but but we settled on on you know what was essentially you know kind of uh layouts which we, which we, which is which is what you do before drawing a final comic page which is about getting the essential information across clearly but you're not you know laboring a, a, over the artwork and um yeah so so it, it it was done pretty quickly um and but because of that i found that i wasn't there were some scenes and some you know environments etc that doing it in that fast style it, it, it wasn't uh, you know I, I was kind of wanting to 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 realize some stuff more so i started doing just some painted imagery as well so so because of that it, you know the work ended up kind of expanding into costume design and environment design and stuff as well so um but it was it was a really sort of fluid you know sort of um kind of natural progression really and 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 uh and uh you know yeah, yeah the, the 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 storyboards are pretty pretty quick but i but i did get the chance to sort of you know, you know, do, do the other work as well. Mm. Did 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 the things like the design, uh, particularly of the costume and of of the environment, did they work out as you had envisaged them, or or was there a process by which um, people, uh, uh, you know, people changed those things? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I when I got involved, you know, Alex had a very specific idea, you know, about. Uh, a, a lot of the elements, um, you know, the, the city wasn't wasn't going to be a labyrinth of futuristic science fiction tropes with flying cars and robots, and you know he 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 you know he had very specific ideas about these these you know the, the mega blocks, the city blocks being monolithic, separate, you know, very kind of. Um, so a more more harsher reality than than some of the more wackier side of, of the of the dread comic and and all, all, all of that had, had had already been decided so it was just about and then the same with the uniform you know it was, it was anything that wasn't functional wasn't going to be in there so for example dread's chain you know in, in a in a gnarly fist fight you can just grab that chain and pull his head his head towards your fist you know you know that that's that 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 that, that, that gives you know your opponent quite an advantage to have something they can grab hold of so so things like that were all already gone so it was just about pushing those parameters really and um it was massively challenging because you know alex is a really smart guy and 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 brilliant to work with because he's sort of it's like a cliche but he kind of demands the best you know it's like everything everything that's in that film has to be there because it's functional not you know there there was there was no whimsy in it at all it was all functional and um but i think because of that uh you know what we've got is a film and a world that feels very believable, you know, even like the way they handled Anderson and the psychic abilities, it feels kind of credible somehow. And, and, and that, that was really, you know, yeah, that was a real challenge and, and, and uh, really exciting to work with. You know, it, it didn't have the, the kind of crazier, funnier side of Mega City one, but, 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 but what it did do was, was I thought, um, you know, really effective. Mm. Mm. I mean, ever since uh, the film came out, we've we've had the uh, the the bring back dread uh, campaign, which uh, has has first focused on um, uh, getting a sequel, but then uh, trying to encourage um, uh, TV companies to uh, sure to, uh, to, to, to focus on dread. Um, uh, I mean, what, what what do you think about that? About people's hunger for for for, for more of dread. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it would be great. I, you know, how good would a Netflix series be? Because mm. you could, you could literally focus on the city then as well, rather than Dread. You could have all these different stories, just like you know, the, just like 2008 did so well. Um, and you know, it just feels like a perfect. The, the, the world is already there. It feels like people clearly are, are into it. The, the world itself, I mean, you know, which gives it a perfect platform for something mm. like a series to 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 come from because because uh you know it's, it's already established um yeah i mean I, I i would love to see more um i doubt very much whether it would be alex doing anything with it but but, but i would still love to see um you know that that the world that we did in the first movie yeah. um brought to life elsewhere yeah absolutely yeah, yeah um although uh you are scottish hence jock um you've you've spent most of your life uh down in uh, uh in devon Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the Totnes Mafia, where it's 
kind of yourself and Dom and Lee Garbit and 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 various other folks. There seems to be this this kind of little knot of uh, artistic talent that's kind of appeared uh, 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 around this this kind of you know sleepy Devon town. <laughs> why, why do you think that is? Um, I, I I don't know. I mean, Totnes is a bit of a unique place. I mean. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of creative people around here, you mm. know. Um, uh, friend Joe, who's who's band Metronomy now, are doing really well. Uh, ben Howard, the singer, is from Totnes. Um, there's there's been you know there are, there is a bit of a creative hub as a place. Um, I don't know why, comics wise, we, we, we've all kind of um, you know we've all gathered here. I mean, I, I met Dom when I moved down here, not knowing anything about, about Totnes. So I just mm. heard that someone else was into comics so i was really keen to meet him and and he was turned out to be an amazing artist so which mm. made it even better um and then yeah and then lee garbett moved down as well and we shared a studio t- together um who knows maybe it's something in the water <laughs> um now uh the 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 the, the art of jock the book that, that um, you've got coming out um yes that's an awful lot of work to sift through to find sort of key <laughs> moments because i mean you, i mean you say you you've been doing this 15 years that that's still a relatively short career but you've done a remarkable range of of, of things you know you've done movies you've done comics uh you've done posters you know there's yeah. there, there's lots of stuff in there um what was it like uh going through for example your 2000 AD stuff was, was it was it kind of evoking things that you'd forgotten yeah, it was, and 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 it was it was hard to um, because when when the the idea of doing a book was first kind of put to me, I thought, God, I mean, it, do I you know, do I have the work to go in a book? But actually, when I started um, making the selections, I realised the the problem was going to be what not to put in it. You know, yeah. there was I was, and yeah, and two thousand eighty was was a was a really good example because. Um, I, I amassed quite a lot of stuff. Um, like for example, my first dread cover now, now hangs above Duncan Fogredo's drawing board and he kindly did a scan of it for me to send it over. Um, but, but that isn't in the book. Um, right. Sean, Sean Phillips scanned one of my early covers as well to send to me. So, so I kind of amassed a, a lot of work so that I could have it all in front of me. Um, but from that, you know, we only had, you know, a, a limited, limited space, you know, because, because the, because the, yeah, the book covers, the comics work from 2000 through to DC and Marvel and witches and image work um posters and film work so there, so there was a there's a lot of stuff in there um but yeah it, it was it was it was it was like a double-edged sword looking through the early stuff you know sometimes i was pleasantly surprised and other times i was slightly horrified <laughs> <laughs> you know? um but uh but funny enough with the 2008 work it was it was you know it was just nice to go through the dread covers again because i do have such history with that character and, and you know i'm really pleased that, that there's a there's a big um a dread you know uh uh um element to the book if there are uh, if if there's somebody out there who who uh, hasn't necessarily encountered your stuff perhaps they weren't reading 2080 when you were around uh, or anything since um what what what's what's the kind of 2080 moment for you uh where where that you would point them to, to say that is emblematic of um my my time on on the prog uh from my work do you mean yeah um i probably lenny zero mm. um probably um just because, you know, there's, for me, Lenny Zero was the best of both worlds because we actually cheekily set it in Just Red's world, you know, in Mega City One, but we got to tell our own story, so we yeah. could, so we could play around with the 2080 world, but also do do our own thing. Um, but um, but yeah, story wise, like I say, I I, I I wish I I wish I had more Dread stories to 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 draw on to to. Um, to answer your question better because uh <laughs> actually actually you know what there was one that i quite like it was so yeah. throwaway it was a little throwaway john magna story called crossing ken dodd mm. and and it was about getting the, the the tax inspector guy from one side of a street to another um, and and that's all the story was and and because he was he was the inspector of taxes he was hated so much that basically people were were like you know just going all out to 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 kill to murder him to 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 to, to get rid of him, um, you know, 
launching rockets and 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 you know flyby shootings and all, all kinds of stuff and it was just ridiculous you know and the punchline was that he was the tax guy and um i, I remember that just being being really enjoyable to draw and there was a big double page spread with dread screaming you know and kind of rockets coming down and uh so maybe that maybe crossing ken, ken dodd um, Ken Dodd be Ken, by the way, Ken Dodd being Ken Dodd Boulevard, not not <laughs> not the famous hilarious comedian that we all grew up with. <laughs> so uh the Art of Jock is, is is coming out. What what can people expect when they pick it up? Sure. I mean it's it, it basically has uh if every element of, of the work that I've done over the last 15 years. So it starts off with uh, early comics work with 2000 AD, mm-hmm. goes into my DC and Marvel work, but um also has Nearly, well, I was going to say all of my Mondo posters, but pretty much most of my Mondo posters, which is the first um, first time that any of that stuff has been uh, uh, reprinted. Mm. And also my concept work has got um, a big section on Dread, big section on Ex Machina. Um, so it's, you know, it, it will hopefully offer a kind of you know there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff um uh there's a there's interviews and 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 uh uh words all the way through as well as pictures <laughs> <laughs> it's not all just pictures there's uh you know I, I, dare i say insights mike right. in, into Ooh, in, okay. into yeah. working in, on on all these projects so um yeah and, and it's out, out in september um it's mondo's first foray into publishing so i'm very proud that, that they've chosen me to, to as their first their first book mm, mm. brilliant brilliant well um one thing i, I also want to mention was that um on the 28th of uh, september you're at the big bang uh, comic store in dublin aren't you for for, yes. for a signing and um john uh, uh, and bruno uh, from the big bang have very kindly uh, allowed us to uh, to group this in with uh, the prog 2000 signing that is uh, that is happening that week so it's all part fantastic of fe- a global festival of thrill power um so since it's going to be part of the, of the Proc 2000, what, what, what's it like uh, not just to uh, be a part of that legacy of, of, of 40 years of, of 2000 AD, but also w- one of the big names, you know, one of the people who's really gone on, you know, who gets mentioned alongside people like Bolland and McMahon and the Square, you know, is going on to, to bigger and better things. Well, um, that's, I mean, that's very kind of you to say. I... I, I, I I mean, my honest reaction to you saying that is just kind of, you know, disbelief, really, you know, um, <laughs> uh, to be honest. Um, um, I mean, if I, I love 2000 and I love Dread and if if my name is 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 somehow in, in the in the story of 2000 AD, then, you know, what, a, what an amazing thing that, um, you know, because I, I can remember as a kid reading it and dreaming that, that I'd get to, to draw for it. And then I remember you know, knowing the publication date that, that, that there was first going to be one of my drawings in 2080 and getting up first in the morning and rushing down to the news agents. And, you know, there was a huge moment seeing, seeing a drawing of, of dread, you know, that I'd done in, in the comics. So, um, uh, that, the, my honest answer is that it's very kind of you to say, but I can't <laughs> quite process that, that, that idea if that's okay. <laughs> Now, one thing that you may have noticed cropped up in uh, our chats with Pete and Chuck was the uh, the influence of that classic golden age period of 2080 from the 1980s, whether uh, it, it was the art of the script, the characters, whatever. Um, the man responsible for commissioning so much of that uh, incredible period, uh, Steve McManus, is publishing his memoir this month. Uh, the uh, special signed hardbacks have all sold out from our web store, but the paperback is available from our web store, from Amazon and all good bookshops um the mighty one is a warm reminiscence about his time in uh, the nerve center from uh, commissioning series such as halo jones slain the horn god uh, all the way through to uh, his uh, research trips to america while looking to launch mature comics titles you may remember we had Steve on the Thrillcast some time ago uh, when uh, we announced the book, but uh, he came into the office to sign uh, the hardbacks, so we grabbed him and uh, locked him in the uh, Thrillcast sound booth uh, so we could have another chat with him. <laughs> 
Well, it's an absolute honour to uh, welcome Stephen Manners, not just back onto the 2080 podcast, but also here in the Nerve Centre itself. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Mike. Great to see you. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you in here. You've been busy uh, signing copies of uh, of your memoir. Uh, I have here at the uh, yeah in the offices. Uh, two hundred of the hardback and two hundred um, paperback. Ye gods! I'm surprised your hand hasn't fallen off. After, <laughs> after <today. laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, we've we've had you on the podcast before, where we've talked about the Mighty One and 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 what it was like uh, at 2008 in the 1980s. One thing I'm curious about is um, having come to the office now and seeing um the uh, the setup that we have how does that differ from things in your day uh, visually uh, you can't compare the two in my day it was four desks i've come today for the first time to your offices in oxford and i see something like the star trek enterprise <laughs> um <laughs> everyone's seated and someone saying this and that so it's 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 another world yeah and obviously everything we do is digital now um uh, when uh 2080 was put together in the 1980s uh that was very much kind of scalpels and and um gum and and uh, you know physical pages of artwork coming into the office yeah yeah artists would post their work in I've always thought that was highly dangerous, but it always used to arrive somehow. They either rolled or, you know, straight package. Mm. Uh, we never lost any artwork, so that's to the, <laughs> the post office, <laughs> I guess. Um, and uh, then, yeah, you'd need to um, ask a letterer to cut out the words and stick them on the artwork and then send them to the Reaper house to photograph. Wow, I mean, that 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 that's such a a more extensive process um, than 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 what we have now, where you know we've, we've got email, everything's done, uh, like I say, digitally. Um, with something like the, the the Mighty One, it's full of reminiscences. It's full of these incredible anecdotes. Um, do you uh, do you miss those days? Oh yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. It was happy days. You know, we were all. The four of us in the office are changing four, but hmm. you know, like a band changes members, or some join, some leave, but effectively we all have the same mission. And then uh, the, the contributors, writers, artists, letterers, colorists, kind of building it into a big kind of festival. Hmm. And uh, at that festival, everyone wanted to show what they could do. Hmm. Hmm. And do, do you think there was a, a, a feeling, because certainly as, as a reader, I'm, I'm, I, I came to 2000 AD um, in the early 1990s, so it was it was after um, you'd, you'd moved on. But uh, you know, I've I've caught up on all of the all of the the, the, the classic 1980s stuff, as I'm sure many of our readers uh, have as well. Um, was there a feeling that uh, just working at 2000 AD meant that people were bringing their A game, that it inspired them to to, to go that bit further? Yeah, it set the bar very high. I mean, you didn't get into 2000. Well, to be fair. You did, uh, I don't know about a, a high bar, but if you got in, then perhaps you were helped to achieve that high jump later on. Mm. So it wasn't just about professionals coming in, it was youngsters who you would help achieve um, the, the kind of standards. And, and that, but as Glenn Fabry said to me, basically, you let me learn my art in, in public, mm. which we did. And it wasn't just Glenn, it was we had the confidence. So it's like new bands, put them on. Open mic. As editor, um, how much of a hand did, did you actually have in, in, in bringing people on, in, in giving practical advice to, to new creators? Well, by and large, um, people who wanted to work for 2000 AD had three routes, one through an agent, one through a submission in the post, mm. kind of cold call, and the third was knowing someone who worked on the title say you're an artist and you knew Pat Mills he might sort of put a word in for you and mm. say I'll send you their work and say Steve this guy's got promise what can we do to get him in the comic sure sure uh, is there an, is there a creator in particular that, that, that you remember uh, when they first started maybe um, you're thinking well this person has promise but I'm not sure how it's going to develop and then by the time they'd spent time at 2080 it had they'd blossomed well, the fastest example of that, mm. it would be Glenn February. Right, okay. I mean, within kind of like eight pages, so you could call that 
three issues. <laughs> yeah. You suddenly <laughs> saw this picture and you thought, oh my God, this guy's got it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's on the road, he's taken off. You know, mm. the plane has, has just started and has taken off. Um, but in other cases, it took longer. Yeah. Uh, they may have had to wait for <laughs> permission to take off. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the fast example I remember. Right. So that doesn't mean that he was ready, good to go. But we published and then he, he got to go. Yeah. Because that, that's not normally a, a, an avenue that many creators actually have these days. Um, because uh, particularly in American comics, series uh, live and die on their first couple of issues and, and, and their sales. They don't necessarily have that ability to learn in print. Um, do you think that was a major factor in, in 2018 producing the, uh, th this roster of creators of such incredible talent who have gone on to be such big stars yeah without a doubt i mean so <clears throat> um yeah uh you could take the risks right yeah yeah yeah. simple as that because you knew that um surrounding a bit like a kind of mother ship these prototypes were the big hitters dread scrunching drug mm. so the scarers and the wagners and the mills and were kind of shepherding <laughs> these people up <laughs> And uh, and they in turn became famous, and would, you would use them to bring in your talent. Mm. And let's talk about the mighty one uh, a little bit, which is out uh, in the uh, beginning of September. Yep. Um, while you were writing that, were were things bobbing up in your memory that you thought you had forgotten about? Were, were, were the, did the process of delving back into your memory stir up more memories? Oh yeah, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. Um, which was great. So it was a journey yeah. for me. It wasn't just a kind of looking in a diary. I had no diary. I, <laughs> my sole reference was my memory. Right. And, and the more I went back, um, helped by reading the progs, of course, the more things were triggered. Sure. And so it became kind of like a snowball of fragments. And then um, I was pleased just to kind of build these into some kind of narrative. Mm. Um, and... Uh, so the book does have a beginning, middle, and a rather dramatic end. Right, right. Well, we, we won't give that away. Um, but uh, I, I mean, it was interesting reading it. Uh, there's there's examples that, that I hadn't necessarily heard of before of, of, of attempts at censorship, um, whether they were internal attempts or, uh, or external. There's one particular Strontium Dog example um, where uh, complaints were made. Um, I think for me, what was fascinating was that um, people talk about the act, the days of action, mm. and uh, how that was effectively banned and neutered, and how this created 2000 AD. But 2000 AD still had an edge well into uh, uh, the, the, the 80s and 90s, where it was still uh, rattling cages and uh, and winding people up. Um, was was that a, a, a were you conscious of continuing that kind of slightly rebellious spirit from the from the very early days? Yeah, it's just a question of keeping the uh, the, the steering the car on the road because right. uh, sometimes my cage was rattled, you know. Right. Um, um, so there's always this kind of fine line between yeah, go for it, and no, slow down. Uh, this will inflame that part of the, you know. It's all very well to be subversive, but don't subvert the mothership. Don't, right. you know, send yourself down like the Hindenburg in flames. <laughs> well, was, was there a specific example where, where um, uh, an artist or writer went a little bit too far and you had to rein them in that you can remember? Well, I, I think by then it was too late. <laughs> <and it was, laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember censoring anything mm. at all. Uh, well, okay, no. Um, when Pat Mills created Slain, he, uh, he, uh, the first few episodes, he was talking about how the Celts would cut, would cut a man's head off and turn it into a brain ball yeah. where they would drink from. So he was then able to take that message, that kind of uh, metaphor, into some of the characters talking about, oh, I like some brain balls now. And yeah. I just knew that the word balls would not go down well. And I, I, I do regret it. So I had Tom Frame change the word balls. Um, so that was a bit of craven cowardice by me. But there you go. Slane is still now a mega hit. So. <laughs> well, exactly. But I, I guess ultimately that's that's the job of an editor is just to just to be that guiding hand and and um, or a coward. <laughs> 
won't go that far. Well, um, <laughs> to be fair to Pat, he never rang up and said, oh, maybe he half suspected I was going. Right. But uh, <laughs> it was a bit of a fail, to use a current current word. Um, with, uh, with some of the anecdotes in, uh, in, in, in The Mighty One, are there any that stand out as your particular favourites, ones that you are really treasured memories? Yeah, the, the, the treasured memory for me is me and John Wagner when we were sharing a flat right. in Campbell. Um, there was nothing there, it was a wasteland, and all we had was the pub opposite. And the memory is that the barman was the spitting image of um, the actor um, uh, Robert Mitchum. Mm. He, I mean, he was Robert Mitchum, and right. we were so taken with this that we would sit at the bar just to look at him more. <laughs> Um, and we knew he was pretending not to be Robert Mitchum, but he was Ron from round the corner. Right. And he paid us no interest apart from wanting the correct change for a couple of fags and uh, two pints of lager. But we knew, we knew he was Robert Mitchum. <laughs> and the last time I saw that guy, he was sitting at a table with a, with a pint reading the paper. But I knew, I just knew that under the table was iced tea and under the table was the latest script from Hollywood asking him to come back. <laughs> I, I, there, there, there is something sort of, I guess, deeply romantic about the, the, the notion of, of, you know, creating those sharing flats and, and uh, you know, every, everything feeding into that mentality. Um, what's your uh, overriding uh, feeling about those days, having revisited them as part of reading the book? What's the, the overriding emotion that kind of floods back? Well, nostalgia is, I think, by definition, a, a very happy place to mm. ex feeling to experience. So I would say, um, as we all say about the past, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I was it was a, it was a, a journey into the past. It was emotional, and uh, uh, but by and large, it was uh, yeah a nice trip. Mm -hmm. And and having worked on on uh, so many of the comics. Uh, the, the, the many of our listeners will remember from their from their youth. Um, what's it like to to know that uh, along with creators like John and Pat and, and Glenn and so many others that you've 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 essentially warped several generations of British children? Well, that was part of the process, and uh, that's great. I'm liking that. <laughs> I hope they buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> we hope they do too. Please go and buy Steve's book. Because you are 40 now. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, we've only uh, able to have a, a short time with you in the office, Steve, but thank you so much for coming in and, uh, and talking a little bit more. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed racking your brain for uh, uh, for memories of uh, 2008 and on behalf of everyone listening uh, and everyone at 2008 thank you for being that guiding hand uh, for one of the most profoundly important parts of many of our lives um, it's uh, uh, not not to be too hyperbolic about it but um yeah it's uh, it, it, it's wonderful to actually meet you in the flesh same here thank you <laughs> no worries Well, it's almost time to say Splendid Verthrig, Earthlets. So thank you very much for tuning in to the 2080 Thrillcast. And thank you to our guests, Pete, Jock and Steve, for being so generous with their time and talking to us about the amazing projects, which I think any 2080 fan can appreciate. Um, we'll be back in two weeks' time for more from the galaxy's greatest comic. Um, do be sure to give us a rating on iTunes if you follow us on there, uh, and also uh, a comment if you feel the need. Uh, but most importantly, please do spread the word about the 2080 Thrillcast because uh, this is all for you, the listeners. So uh, until next time, Earthlets, Splendid Verthrig. Now, are you reading the galaxy's greatest comic? 2080 is in orbit every Wednesday from all good news agents and comic book stores. 2080 is also available digitally. You can get PDF copies, which are DRM free from our website at www.2080online.com, or you can download the free 2080 app for Apple and Android devices. Now you get that by searching for 2000 space AD in iTunes and the Google Play Store. There's also the Judge Dread magazine, which is published in print and digital every month with more pages, uh, more Dread-centric stories, special features, and a bagged reprint magazine featuring forgotten 2080 classics. And don't forget 
that are graphic novels including absolute timeless classics like Strontium Dog, Ace Trucking, Flesh, Judge Dredd, Slain, Robo Hunter and many, many more are also available digitally through our web shop and app. We're on social media with the latest announcements, competitions and freebies. Search on Facebook and Google Plus for 2000 AD. If you're on Instagram, we're Insta 2000 AD and you can follow us on Twitter where we are at 2000 AD. Remember, athletes, don't be a Grexnix, Splendig Verthrig. Oh.